Well, hi everybody. We've got the book and I have some time, so we're going to do chapter 10, which is called Rice Puddin. Christmas morning, I let Lonnie sleep late while I heated a dishpan full of water and washed my underwear, spare shirt, and jeans. I couldn't do much about Lonnie's washing. He was sleeping in his dirty shirt, and his old overalls were so full of grease that I couldn't have got them clean without boiling them in lime water. After I had my washing done and hung out on a creosote bush, I washed our dishes in silverware and scoured the frying pan and Dutch oven with sand. With shiftless shimmying the way she was, she kicked up as much dust as a cavalry regiment, and most of it seemed to have settled in the orange crate we used as a pantry. And from cooking over greasewood campfires, the frying pan, Dutch oven, and dishpan had grown a black shell as thick and hard as a turtle's. After the dishes were done, I started cleaning the hens Lonnie had swiped, but the job would have been easier if he'd just wrung their necks and brought them with their clothes on. In, the way, in that way, I could have rubbed clay into the feathers, smeared on a coat half an inch thick, and roasted them in the coals from the campfire. Then when we were ready to eat them, all I'd have to do would be to whack them against a rock. The hard-baked shells would break like an old flower pot, taking the feathers off clean as a whistle and leaving the meat hot and juicy. But I guess Lonnie had thought he could fool me about having swiped them. He'd yanked off about three quarters of the feathers, just in handfuls, and torn the skin in half a dozen places and had got sand ground into the torn parts. Lonnie never would tell me where he swiped the hens, but it must have been off somebody's roost, and it must have been plenty dark in that hen house. He'd picked two fat ones all right, but it had been years since they'd been pullets. There were dry scales along their breastbones, and they were poochy like geese in the rear. That kind of hen will roast fine in clay if you give it three or four hours in a good deep bed of coals, but if you try to roast it in an ordinary oven, it will usually come out tougher than bullhide. I was afraid ours would come out even worse if I tried to roast them in the Dutch oven, so I decided to cut them up, roll the pieces in white flour, brown them in grease, and stew them in a pot of fricassee. I could hear Lonnie snoring when I picked off the last pin feathers and washed the sand out of the torn places but I'd barely picked up the butcher knife to cut the hens into pieces when he wailed, Aw, buddy, it's Christmas Day. You ain't about to make stew out of them chickens, are you? I spent near onto an hour hunting fat ones like you told me so we could roast them. Sure, I'm going to roast them, I called back. I was just getting ready to take their insides out. But if you want them stuffed, you'd better shake out of that bedroll and fix our flat tire. I can't make stuffing without stale white bread and sage. I don't believe Lonnie ever woke up or got any faster in all the time I knew him. Oh, I don't believe Lonnie ever woke up or got up any faster in all the time I knew him. By the time I had the hens cleaned, he had jacked up the wheel and was going at the flat tire like a coyote trying to dig a gopher out from under a rock. Come give me a hand, buddy, he hollered. Don't reckon this here tire's been off in a month of Sundays. It's froze to the rim like as if it were cemented. Here, take this piece of broke spring and pry the loose side while I get the tire iron and screwdriver in over here. It took us nearly half an hour to pry the tire off the rim, and when Lonnie took the inner tube out, it looked like a patchwork quilt. There were already two rubber plugs in it and six or seven glued-on patches. Jeepers, Lonnie said as he turned it around and looked it over. It's a wonder we didn't have a blowout on one of them mountain roads. And brother, that would have been all, what with shiftless being a mile loose and steering gear and wheel bushings. Hmm. I'd about as leave a paper sack in there as this thing. T'would hold air better. Well, you go on with your housekeeping, and I'll get this hole plugged up one way or another. I'd daubed a good thick covering of clay on the biggest sweet potato so it would bake in the coals, and I'd peeled the onions and was cleaning the celery when Lonnie brought a came over to the fire and asked to borrow my new knife. As soon as I passed it to him, he reached down and began cutting one leg of his overalls off at the knee. What in the world are you doing that for? I asked him. Gotta make a boot for that tire, he told me. Where it blowed out, it's worn to paper thin, and I won't be wearing these dirty britches no more no ways. Anyhow, not to town and on Christmas Day. A man's gotta get dressed up once in a while. I helped Lonnie while he folded the piece he'd cut off his overalls and stuck it over the broken place inside the tire. Then we put the mended tube back in, pried the tire onto the rim, and pumped and pumped and pumped. The old air pump hadn't been used for so long that the leather valve washers were all dried out and the only way we could get it to take hold at all was by unscrewing the top and pouring in water every few minutes. I think we got about as much water as air into the tire, and when we had it about halfway up, Lonnie told me, leave it go. That's enough to get me into town, and I'll fill it up at a garage. They don't charge you nothing for air. You just tell them you'll come back later and buy some gas. He peeked up at the sun and shouted, Jeepers creepers, it's near on to noon. Mind filling the radiator while I change my clothes? 
I'd filled the radiator and wiped the thickest of the dust off shiftless by the time Lonnie came back, and he really looked like a gentleman. He had on his new shirt and overalls, with the cuffs turned up the way I wore mine, but nearly six inches above his ankles. He'd shaved, combed his hair, polished his old boots as well as he could with bacon grease, and dusted off his hat. Reckon I'll need about four bits, he told me as he peeked at his reflection in the windshield. Spent myself clean broke last night, what with the mince pie and all. I gave him a half dollar and said, that ought to do it all right. All we need is a loaf of stale white bread and a dime's worth of sage. I'd crank shiftless and Lonnie had warmed her up till she began hitting on all four. Then he leaned out the door and asked, look, buddy, if I was to get some rice and raisins, do you reckon you could whack up a rice pudding? My ma always used to make it on Christmas and it was la larip and good. Rice custard, I asked him. I don't know, he said, but there was ye yellow all in amongst the rice and lots of raisins. Then you'll have to get a quart of milk and a nutmeg, I said. We've got plenty of eggs. Both those hens were laying and they were full of yolks. Lonnie gave Shiftless a shot of gas and kicked the pedal into low and started off with a roar. By the time he'd gone a hundred feet, he had old Shiftless up to fifteen miles an hour and she was going down the road like a drunk running for a train. Every time the front wheel came around to the place where Lonnie had put the piece of overall leg, it hopped and made a sound like a flapping sole on a worn-out shoe. I didn't expect Lonnie to be gone more than an hour at the most, but it was nearly two before he came back, and when he came he was excited as a little boy at his first carnival. We're all set, buddy, we're all set, he yelled as he turned shiftless off the road and came dodging toward camp through the creosote bushes. I was pretty dang sure of it when I seen the, that little horse last night. When Lonnie turned off the road, I'd expected our patched tire to blow at any second, and I was watching that wheel when he pulled around the clump of brush between us, but the old tire wasn't on it. Instead, there was a pretty fair-looking one, not new, but without any of the canvas lining showing. Lonnie jumped out over the door as Shiftless switched her tail and came to a stop, then he threw his arm around my neck and hollered loud enough to nearly break my eardrums. We're all set, buddy. We're all set, I tell you. Look what I got for that little old horse you made. Two gallons of gas to boot. Ba boy, howdy, if you can make enough of them, I can trade them for all the gas and grub we'll need, even tires. If that little critter had been made out of something hard instead of mud, I could have got a brand new tire for him. That's fine, I told him. I'll bet I can make them as fast as you can trade them off, but did you get the other stuff he went after? All but the milk, he said, and that's a cinch. There was only one store open, and they didn't have no milk, but I seen some cows on the way back. Three, four of them with fall calves. All we gotta do is catch one of them and milk her. Calves the size of them don't suck till late in the afternoon. If we was to go right now, we'd likely get a gallon or two. Wished I had a horse, a live one. I'd catch one of them old heifers and bring her on into camp so we could milk her whenever we wanted. Ain't you supposed to be drinking milk regular anyhow? Lonnie's idea sounded like a good one, especially since he said there were no houses between our camp and Fort Thomas. We shook out our throw ropes, took a few practice tosses at creosote bushes, put the dishpan on the back seat, and started off down the road. Lonnie said the cattle were on a desert pasture where there was plenty of fairly tall brush, so we didn't think we'd have a bit of trouble in catching a cow. We'd each pick one with a good full bag, sneak up on her from behind a bush, and toss a loop over her head. It didn't work that way. Those cows were as wild as antelope, nearly as fast, and they must have had eyes and ears like eagles. We could see them from the road when we got to within a quarter mile, but they didn't pay a bit of attention to Shiftless's clatter. But when we'd pulled off the road, hidden Shiftless behind a clump of mesquite, and were sneaking up on them afoot, they began drifting away. They didn't do any running at first, but just drifted on whenever we'd get within fifty yards of them. Then when we tried to close in faster, they ran, all except a big white-faced bull that seemed to be on the prod. He kept between us and the cows, and he covered their retreat in grand style. If we tried to gain an inch, he'd whirl around, paw dirt up over his back, and dare us to come on, halfway between a bellow and a growl. From behind a bush, Lonnie made signals with his arms to show me that we should circle wide around, but that didn't work either. The old bull caught on as quickly as I did. Instead of just turning and pawing, he began charging back and forth toward one of us and then the other, shaking his head and bawling, and the cows kept drifting farther back into the brush. At last, Lonnie mot motioned for me to come over to where he was. Ain't no sense in this, he told me. If we keep on this way, we'll drive him clean into Mexico before we ever catch one. Tell you what we'll do. It's open enough in here that I can drive shiftless easy, and you can stand on the running board and catch one of them old heifers as I go past her. You could snub her on one of them irons the top's supposed to bolt onto, and if the bull gets proddy, we'll lead her on back to camp before we milk her. He'll, he'd never leave the herd to follow that far. Lonnie was right about being able to drive shiftless through the brush, and by not being too careful about missing the smaller clumps, he didn't have much trouble in catching up to the cows. But I had all kinds of trouble in trying to stand on the running board and swing a rope. 
On horseback, you don't have to worry about balance when you go hightailing after a cow in brush country. The pony will follow right behind, dodging whichever way she does, and he leans as he turns so the rider can go along with him. But Shiftless didn't work that way, or Lonnie either. He couldn't turn one-tenth as fast as the slowest of those old cows, and Shiftless leaned the wrong way when she did turn. The horse falls were nothing compared to the spills I took off the running board before we discovered how to do it. We had to take Lonnie's rope, make a harness for me, and lash it to a door hinge. In that way, I had both hands free, and I didn't get tossed every time we made a sharp turn. But it still didn't work because Lonnie couldn't turn sharp enough. The only thing that saved us was that one old cow, the one with the smallest calf, decided to desert the herd. She took off in a line straight for Mexico, and Lonnie took off after her. Of course, he had to do a little weaving to get through the brush, but it wasn't bad. And when the cow got a little winded, he pulled up almost alongside of her. I didn't have a bit of trouble in tossing my loop over her head, and Lonnie stayed close enough that I had her snub tight to the top iron before she hit the end of the rope. Anyone would think a cow that had been run full tilt for a mile would be ready to give up and act reasonable, but that was the most unreasonable cow I ever had anything to do with. Five or six times she hit the end of that rope so hard she threw herself, and each time she nearly jerked shiftless off her wheels. Then when one of us would try to follow up the rope toward her, she'd twist down so we could twist her down for milking, she'd charge. After we'd barely escaped from a dozen charges, Lonnie shook out his rope and hind-legged her, but she was as stout as an elephant. Even with Lonnie weighing 150, she could drag a leg behind her and pull him around like a poodle on a string, and she kept shrieking like a train engine on a cold night. If we could have stayed with it and worn her down a little more, I think we might have been able to throw her and hogtie her for milking, but we gave out before she did. <clears throat> we had to sit in the shade of a bush for a while to catch our breath and figure out what to do next. It was Lonnie who figured out the scheme that worked. Moving real slowly so as not to excite the cow, we unhitched the head rope, ran it through the spokes of the near front wheel under the engine, and snubbed it to a spoke in the rear wheel. Then we did the same with the heel rope, but used the rear wheels. In that way, the cow couldn't charge the one doing the snubbing, and since she couldn't see him, she didn't worry too much about shiftless. I did the hazing in as quietly as I could, and each town... Each time the cow sidled nearer to shiftless, Lonnie took in on the snubbing ropes, first one end and then the other. It wasn't more than twenty minutes before we had the cow winched up against the side of shiftless so tight that she couldn't wiggle. With the heel rope on her outside leg, she couldn't kick with the inside one, and her, and her head was plastered tight against the front wheel. The only thing she could have done was to flop over onto me while I was milking her, but Lonnie took care of that by climbing onto the back seat and hauling on her tail. All the time she'd been... All the time we'd been trying to make the old cow listen to reason, her calf had been standing back at the edge of the bushes, bawling for us, bawling out, bawling us out for trying to swipe his dinner. But he must have done all right before we got there. I stripped right down to the last drop and didn't get over three pints, but it sloshed around so much in the dishpan that I couldn't have handled much more anyway. That old cow acted as if her whole fight had been only to protect her honor. As soon as I'd finished milking her, she stood as quietly as if she'd been barn-raised. And she didn't fight at all when we slipped the ropes off. And there they are, battling the cow. She trotted away into the brush, then stopped just before she was out of sight and looked back over her shoulder as if she were telling us, I'll let my husband know about this. I don't know whether or not she let him know, but he didn't give us any trouble when we drove back to the road. I wouldn't watch I couldn't watch where we were going very well because I had to hold the dishpan high to keep the milk from slopping. It didn't seem as if we'd spent very much time in getting that three pints of milk, but the sun was halfway down toward the mountains when we got back to camp, and of course the fire had gone out. While Lonnie built a new one with lots of greasewood roots so we'd have plenty of big coals for the roasting, I made the stuffing for the hens. It wasn't as good as Mother used to make, but it wasn't too bad either. I broke the stale bread into little chunks, moistened it with milk, tossed in a couple of egg yolks from one of the hens, sliced in plenty of onion and celery, and sprinkled it good and heavy with salt, pepper, and sage. I was pretty sure those hens were going to be awfully tough if I tried to roast them dry. So I jammed the biggest one into the Dutch oven, put in a little water, covered it tight, and hung it over the new fire where it could steam till the roasting coals were ready. I'd made custard pies when I was batching with my grandfather, so I knew how to make the custard part, but I'd never tried to make a rice custard pudding. I knew Mother baked hers in the oven, but I didn't know whether she put the rice in raw or boiled at first. It didn't. It really didn't make much difference, because I was going to have to boil our rice anyway, since we had only one Dutch oven. 
and the only thing I had to boil it in was the ditch pan, so we poured the milk into the quart jar Mrs. Larson had put my stewed chicken in. That was just a little more than enough to fill it, and we drank that. After I'd washed the pan, I dumped the pound of rice Lonnie had brought from town, explained to him that the raisins would be added later, and poured in enough water to cover the rice. Then Lonnie found some good-sized rocks, and we propped the pan up over the fire. Everything went fine at first, and we sat watching the grains of rice bubble up to the top as the water began to boil. But it drank that water as if it had been a herd of cattle. I had to keep adding more and more to keep it from sticking to the bottom of the pan and burning. We tried setting it off the fire to slow it down, but that didn't do any good, and it swelled even faster after we put the raisins in. By the time it was cooked soft, we had nearly a dishpan full, and it was sort of sticky. Oh, that's all right, I told Lonnie. Of course, I can't eat it, and you won't want this much pudding, but you can always eat the rest of it for breakfasts like mush. Lonnie didn't like the idea of eating rice for mush, and he didn't think we had too much for pudding. But I was kind of licked for a way to make the custard, with the dishpan full of rice and the Dutch oven full of hen. We finally worked it out by pouring part of the milk into the coffee cups. Then I added what were left of the eggs out of the hens. Some of them were as little as peas, poured in more or less sugar, and grated some nutmeg by using a rough stone for a grater. The jar worked fine for mixing, and all we had to do was screw on the top and shake it. Then, of course, we had to keep pouring back and forth between cups until the jar and the jar till we had the mixture all alike. Lonnie poured it over the rice while I stirred it in and grated more nutmeg on top. Even though we couldn't bake it, I think it would have been pretty good rice pudding if I'd stirred it a little harder and broken the sticky lumps up more than I did. The custard cooked fine, just set up close to the fire, and the nutmeg on top made it look as though it had been baked in an oven. We let the first hen sort of steam and stew along till we'd finished the pudding, then drained off what broth there was, drank it, and covered the Dutch oven over the coals for roasting. It was dark before that old biddy was cooked enough that the breast meat would break when I stuck a fork into it and twisted. But she was almost tender by the time Lonnie's sweet potato was done. We put what was left of the onions and celery right into the pot with her, and even if it was a little late when we had our Christmas dinner, it was a darn good one. Lonnie wouldn't say the rice pudding was as good as his mother's, but he ate nearly a quart of it, so it couldn't have been too bad. I didn't dare leave the second hen lying around raw, even though the nights were chilly, so we cooked her while we were eating and re-soaping our saddles before we turned in. It gave us lots of time to talk about what we were going to do after we got steady jobs, and we sang some of the old songs over again three or four times. Lonnie didn't know but a few of them, Silent Night, Jingle Bells, and ones like that. But even if we were nearly broken out of jobs, it wasn't a bad Christmas. And I guess this must be a clay bust of someone. Not sure. But there it is, and that is the end of chapter 10. Bye-bye, everybody.